Welcome to our second video about renal embryology and congenital defects. Today we're going to focus more on the congenital defects that can affect the urogenital system. So let's get started. The first abnormality is called renal agenesis, which means failure of the development of the adult kidney. This can be unilateral affecting one kidney or bilateral affecting both kidneys. This is caused by the failure of interaction between the ureteric bud and the metanephric plastima. These two structures must interact with each other and stimulate the growth of each other. Unilateral cases is more common and it's usually asymptomatic. But unfortunately in the healthy kidney, it tends to be hypertrophied and it's more prone to infection and damage. There is an increased risk of a disease called focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. Bilateral cases are associated with something called Potter sequence. In this image, I want to point out that the amniotic fluid that's contained within the amniotic cavity has a cushing function that helps to protect the baby against compression by surrounding structures. This amniotic fluid is produced through the fetal urine. So any abnormalities in the formation of fetal urine, either through agenesis or malformation of both kidneys or obstruction of the urinary outflow, that leads to the reduced formation of the amniotic fluid or a condition called oligohydramnios. Because of the oligohydramnios, the baby will be compressed against the surrounding structures. And this can lead to deformities of the face and the limbs and other deformities. Also, the amniotic fluid has an important function in the formation or the development of the lungs. So, oligohydramnios can also cause hypoplasia of the lungs. All these constellation of symptoms are called Potter sequence. So the Potter sequence means the abnormal physical appearance of the baby which is caused by the oligohydramnios. And as we said, oligohydramnios means the deficiency of the amniotic fluid, which in turn means there is a deficiency of the production of the fetal urine, because the fetal urine contributes to the formation of the amniotic fluid. So bilateral renal agenesis or obstruction of the urine outflow can result in oligohydramnios. This will lead to the compression of the baby against surrounding structures due to the loss of the Cushing effect of the amniotic fluid around the fetus. So this can lead to limb deformities like club feet and facial deformities like low sit ears, flattened nose, lack of the normal lung development through the distension of the alveoli by the amniotic fluid leads to pulmonary hypoplasia. And usually pulmonary hypoplasia is the cause of death. The umbilical cord can get compressed during labor, leading to fetal heart rate abnormalities, and this is another problem encountered in patients with oligohydramnia. Next is autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease. This is bilaterally enlarged cystic kidneys, so the tissues of the kidneys becomes replaced with cysts. And this is caused by mutation in something called PKHD1 gene, or polycystic kidney disease 1 gene. This gene codes for a protein called fibrocystin protein, which is found in the epithelial cells of the kidneys and the biliary tracts. So you would expect abnormalities in both the kidneys and the biliary system, which in turn will be reflected on the liver. The severity of this condition will determine the age of the presentation, either prenatally or right after birth or later in childhood. So severe disease can be detected during fetal life by fetal ultrasound and is associated with kidney dysfunction and so oligohydramnios and Potter sequence. Late onset disease can be manifested with hepatic dysfunction or hepatic complications like biliary obstruction, liver fibrosis, and portal hypertension. Kidney disease is characterized by hypertension in childhood. So the age of the presentation is determined by the severity of the condition. Next is something called posterior urethral valves. These are obstructive membranes that develops in the posterior urethra. And posterior urethra means the urethra that's very close to the bladder. Let's say in this area here. So this will lead to the obstruction of the urinary outflow. 
This can be diagnosed prenatally through ultrasound that will show bilateral hydronephrosis. And hydronephrosis means the enlargement of the kidney because of fluid accumulation. This hydronephrosis, like we said, will be bilateral because the obstruction in this area will affect both kidneys. This will also result in dilated bladder. It's the most common cause of urinary obstruction in male infants. And this can lead to oligohydramnios and potter sequence. As we said, because of the decreased production of the fetal urine, that will lead to the decreased production of the amniotic fluid. If this disease develops later, this can result in urinary incontinence, urinary tract infections, vesicoureteric reflux, which means reflux of urine from the bladder, which is the vesicle structure, into the ureter, and that's why it's called vesicoureteric reflux, and also can lead to chronic kidney failure. Also, always keep in mind that posterior ureter valves only happens in male infants. It doesn't happen in female infants. Next is vesicoureteric reflux. The word vesico here refers to the urinary bladder. So this is the backward flow of urine from the bladder into the kidneys. This can be primary because of abnormal junction between the ureter and the bladder, something like duplex ureter that we're going to discuss in a minute. Or it can be secondary to the obstruction of urine outflow at the urethra, most commonly caused by what we discussed earlier, posterior urethral valves, which can push the urine up against resistance into the ureters. So the primary cases are caused by abnormal junction between the ureter and the bladder, and this can result in the backflow of urine back into the kidneys. Or it can be secondary by something like posterior urethral valves that causes obstruction and this can lead to the backflow of urine through the bladder into the ureters and into the kidneys. It can be asymptomatic, but it can also lead to some complications like dilatation of the ureters and the kidneys, something called hydronephrosis, urinary tract infections and stones, and also finally into renal failure. Next is duplex collecting system or duplicated ureter. This can occur through either one of two mechanisms. The first one is two ureteric buds grows into the metanephric blastema, and they will drain separately into the bladder. So if this is the mesonephric duct, and this is the ureteric bud, and this is the metanephric blastema, in the first case, another ureteric bud will grow into the metanephric blastema. So we will have two openings or two ureteric openings into the urinary bladder and two separate ureters. In the second case, it's actually one ureteric bud that will bifurcate early before reaching the metanephric blastema. So again, if this is the mesonephric duct, and this is the ureteric bud, and this is the metanephric blastema, so early on, before reaching the metanephric blastema, the ureteric bud will bifurcate into two divisions. So in this case, Still, the ureter opens into the bladder through one opening, but we still have two ureters. So, this is the most common renal abnormality. Either way, the openings into the bladder are underdeveloped. So, this will lead to vesicoureteric reflux, hydronephrosis, urinary tract infections, and obstructions. The next abnormality is called multicystic dysplastic kidney. In this condition, the kidney tissue is replaced with irregular cysts and connective tissue. This is a common cause of abdominal mass in infants, and it's usually unilateral. If it's bilateral, it can lead to oligohydramnios and potter sequence. It's a renal dysplasia that results from the abnormal development of the metanephric blastema. So the abnormality here lies in the development of the metanephric blastema, so then the metanephric blastema will develop into irregular cysts and connective tissue that's non-functional and that will lead to kidney maldevelopment. Next is ureteropelvic junction obstruction. This is an obstruction between the ureter and the renal pelvis. If this is the ureter, and this is the renal pelvis, 
there is an obstruction here that prevents the urine outflow from the renal pelvis into the ureter. And this fluid accumulation will result in what's called hydronephrosis. Hydronephrosis basically means fluid accumulation in the kidney that results from the obstruction of the urinary outflow. Most of the cases of urethropelvic junction obstruction are unilateral. This obstruction can predispose to kidney enlargement, stones, infections, and renal failure. The urethropelvic junction is the last place to canalize during the development of the urogenital system, and that's why it's very liable to obstruction during adulthood. The last abnormality we're going to talk about is horseshoe kidney. This is because of the fusion of the inferior poles of both kidneys. And so as the kidney ascends from the pelvis into the abdominal cavity, they get trapped into the inferior mesenteric artery. The kidneys are still functionally normal, and most commonly it's asymptomatic. But there is an increased risk of erythropelvic junction obstruction, stones, infections, and hydronephrosis. There is also an increased risk of renal cancer, and this specific point is very important. Horseshoe kidney is associated with some chromosomal abnormalities, most commonly Turner syndrome, which is 45XO, and also trisomies 13, 18, and 21. This is the end of the embryology series. Thank you very much for watching. Please don't forget to subscribe, and see you next time.